Thank you very much. So I'm not Erik Ekjörden, but I'm trying to uh, give the speech that Erik would have given if, if he is here. I will start a little bit with a reflection. Uh, we're in, in like just about to bring a new network generation to market. And I was reading up a little bit what happened when we brought 4G to market, um, which um, is pretty much eight and a half years ago. There was a few numbers were standing out in my 4G moment. The first one was that it took around um, 288 base stations to bring up a city back then, which was Stockholm in, uh, in my case. Uh, we delivered 43 megabits downstream, 5 megabit upstream, stunning at that point in time. And we had the same debate, is 4G really faster than 3G or not? Because 3G at that time was pretty much 42 uh, megabits, and we had the same kind of discussion. And the other thing that I think was a little bit remarkable was that it took 33 months before we had the first iPhone with 4G. I think a lot of these numbers will be different this time, but we here in the room, we're all fortunate of being part of this exciting journey when you bring up a new network generation in the, uh, uh, to life. And what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit what's happening in the 3GPP standards in the release from release 13 to release 16 and what is coming in each and every release, and how it's in impacting what we're, what we're doing. If we look at the first thing, we've seen the charts here a couple of times with four different um, boxes regarding what are the use cases are driving this. Uh, with enhanced mobile broadband being the biggest use case, when we have looked at the numbers and where we think it's going to be by 2026, it, the operate the revenues for enhanced mobile broadband is roughly $1 trillion dollars in 2026. Next to it, we have fixed wireless access, which has uh, always been part of the picture when we're talking about mobile generations, but typically becoming at the back end of the life cycle of a, of a mobile technology. Now we're seeing it being introduced and be playing an important role from essentially from day one. We believe that business is a little bit harder to estimate the size of. We uh, have varying estimates between 10 billion US dollars and 100 billion US dollars on a, on a um, on a global basis, depending on a little bit how it pans out, if it become only rural or if it's going to play a key role also in, in urban scenarios. The other two is the machine, massive machine type communication and the critical machine type communication. We've tried to estimate the two of them together and seeing how much is the, the industry potential is going to bring on top of what we already have in, in, in the bottom ones. And in those two top scenarios, we're seeing around 200 billion dollars in additional business for, for the pure connectivity service portion of it, and another 400 million for service enablement and service creation on top of that, that we think can be addressable by, by network operators. So this is creating a very interesting um, um, landscape, I think, and that's a lot of this that we're trying to accomplish and serve these, these potential markets with the, the standards that's been defined so far. If you look at it, what we did in release 13 and release 14, a lot of these things had been very focused on, on LTE, but it try, in, introducing changes that is on the stepping stones or irrelevant for 5G. So we have dedicated core, allowing us to do the first steps towards network slicing. We had latency reductions, so a lot of what we're seeing right now when people say that 4G has been significantly improved regarding latency is coming from that. We had a control and user plane separation, which is the enabler for distributing part of the core network closer to the, to the radio and, uh, and achieving the low latency use cases. Massive MIMO, and last bit, the dual connectivity. So there were a number of different elements here that now are being introduced for 4G that are important stepping stones towards 5G. And a lot of this was, has been standardized, as I said, in 15 and 16. When we look to the first phase of the 5G standardization, what was part of it completed by the end of last year and the rest coming up this summer, we have a couple of interesting things there. The first one was the, the two different architectural options to connect the radios either through the, uh, the, the EPC, from the EPC network through an existing 4G radio or directly with this, uh, 
standalone architecture. We've seen the network slicing has been taken to the next level, not only focused on the core, but bringing in the radio network into the picture, so a more end-to-end like and more advanced form of network slicing. Uh, new radio, perhaps the centerpiece of it all, and what a lot associate when we talk about 5G, a, a flagship feature is that we're using the new radio, and that we have introduced the different options under the uh, non-standalone and standalone architecture being either the 5G EPC, which reusing the existing core, or the 5G core or 5GC, which is building on the new service-based architecture. So these things we have already done, and we have done them with slightly different time schedule where we pushed forward the non-standalone uh, architecture roughly six months ahead of the standalone architecture. If we then look at what, what do we think is going to happen in, in 2000 and, or in release 16, this is not yet defined yet. So what I'm showing here is some examples of things that we from Ericsson think is, is important. The first one, uh, using the new radio in unlicensed spectrum. I think it's been debated and talked about a lot about the importance of spectrum and using the different kind of spectrums that we can get hold of. And we think this is an important expansion. The second one is about refined positioning, getting down to positioning accuracy down to three feet or, or, or a meter. And that this one is having an important way to play, play in manufacturing applications where we see a lot of initial potential. The MIMO evolution of enhancement to S SBA is more or less refining the things that we have already planned and introduced. Uh, the next one is about wireless and wireline convergence. Where we are with the core networks today, we're planning very much for mobile and fixed wireless access, bringing home those to the same core. What we see going down the route here is bringing in the, the wired access or the fiber access into the same core from that, um, that perspective. The cellular IoT, um, it's, it's for the very, very low traffic application on cellular where you don't really want to set up uh, any tunnels. Pretty much what I worked with my first job at Ericsson, where I worked with sending data on the D channel in ISDN. It's a very similar kind of uh, thinking here regarding how we can use uh, the network for the, for the very, very, very low bit application. And the final one here is ultra-reliable, low-latency communication. A lot of the things that we've been pushing forward in the first steps here has been focused on driving down the latency. Uh, the ultra-reliable, low-latency has two elements to it. One is about making it very reliable, and one is making it low-latency. And those two things, one is about robustness and another about, about minimizing code. And we have taken the first step regarding the low latency. We have jobs to do regarding the, the reliability aspects of it. So this is a little bit giving you some ideas and examples of what we can expect in, in R16. Uh, from an architectural overview, uh, I found it when I started to look at this a little bit difficult to follow exactly what's going on. So I'm trying to ex explain here the two, two out of the seven options which we think are most important. The first one being the option three, which essentially from an existing EPC with the 5G EPC functionality added to it, connecting through an LTE base station or an E-Node B to a 5G island or a zone or whatever we decide to call it. Uh, and this is, I would say, where the momentum is for the things that we're going to see uh, with the most aggressive time plans in the world. The second one is using the 5G core and the different, the different 5G uh, core-based architecture. So it's different interfaces down to the new radio, in this case then to an N3 interfaces. And it's using an option called option two, which defines how the 5G core talks directly to a, uh, a new radio. And then there is a range of different options beyond that that could be considered down the road, which is more or less defined 
as we bring this further in, down the implementation journey, and where both 5G core and 5G EPC represent the dual mode core, serving both 4G and 5G radios in the, in the future. So option three and option two for the starting points, depending on which core, and then other things coming into the picture down the road. Uh, the EPC and, and 5G core, um, it's very much about, often get the question, what's the difference from it? How much difference is and what, what does it bring? The biggest changes between IP, EPC and 5G core, as we look right now, is, is one about architecture, where the 5G core has got a service-based architecture and the EPC, the more classical architecture that we know. The other thing is that we're opening up more a APIs in the 5G core for third-party application developers to, to consider. So it's not that big functional differences from start, but what you can do with them down the road is different. So the, the scenario that we see is this is a starting point with an EPC. Next step is when an important step around the journey is to introduce the, um, the core and user plane split for scaling these different network functions depending on what, what they're going to use for. Because as we start mixing, just mixing mobile and fixed wireless traffic, a fixed wireless subscriber is perhaps consuming 100 times as much traffic as a, uh, as a mobile subscriber. So it would only take 1 million fixed wireless subscribers to double the traffic in a mobile network for 100 million mobile users. And with these kind of things, it becomes important looking at how can we, how can we both scale and life cycle manage different network functions independently. This is the more uh, comprehensive picture of what the 5G core architecture look like. And what you see in that picture is that we have different names and the dif different functionalities that we have in the EPC architecture are some are grouped together in different, different logical combinations that what we've uh, had or used to in the past. So there's quite a bit of changes going on within the black boxes here that we call the core network that we hope will bring some exciting things for the future. The final thing I want to talk about is a little bit about what do we think, what can we tell about the distribution of functionality, bringing it closest to the subscribers. And it was mentioned here that everybody agrees that edge computing is important in the future, but everything is called edge computing, but it's located in very different locations. So what we have tried to do here is try to explain what do we think the distribution of functionality is going to look like for different groups of use cases, tying back to the first slide I presented with the four different scenarios, and also seeing what is, what is happening. So for enhanced mobile broadband, the most important thing that we see there is that the user plane is getting distributed further out uh, with uh, controlled planes more or less remaining where we have them today. And that when you look at the enhanced mobile broadband as a slice in the network, that is an important aspect of, of improving the performance. Uh, if we look at the massive <coughs> machine type communication or massive IoT, we don't see that big differences from today if we look at the functionality. The differences that we see here for this type of slice will be more or less business models here, where perhaps not is only bits and byte based models that's going to be in, um, ruling going forward. If we then look at enterprise and industry driven by the high availability, high reliability, and very low uh, latency, there we see a scenario where a lot of what we t typically today call as core network fun functionality will be brought all the way down to um, user premises, either by an operator that would like to offer that services managed at, um, at the enterprise or with a private uh, network. And last bit here, the critical communication, uh, machine type communication. This is where we're seeing perhaps the biggest changes and a lot of optimizations taking place. The user plane being brought up, uh, brought out as far as um, we saw for enhanced mobile broadband, but also changes in the, in the structure for control plane and also the fact that we can combine this at different locations in the network um, depending on what the performance requirements are. So I think that the... Um, the important aspects here as we evolve the network and how we're trying to leverage all these different pieces is a number of different steps in the evolution here taking place as we mature 
We're going to roll out the networks this year, but we're going to have quite a bit of work to do in the different steps that we're taking from the current EPC to the 5G core going forward. With that one, there's three seconds left, so. I'll summarize in 10 seconds. You know it's use case driven. We've seen what the use cases are. R13, R14 laid the foundation uh, on the road to 5G, primarily addressing 4G. R15, that's where we started, what we're having and what we're going to bring to market this year. R16 is very much about next step uh, with a number of different functions that we will know which the prioritize are um, later th um, in the third quarter. We talked about the non-standalone versus standalone architecture and the, and the primary differences in timing and, and, and the evolution approaches. We talked about the two different core networks that can be considered. And we talked about the importance of network slicing and distribution going forward. With that, I've completed the 15 minutes here. <laughs>